that it appears to travel from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn and back again, like the sun does. But it does so every month. Aside from a few naysayers who offered their usual objections, nothing of any substance was offered. The basis for my assertion was the information that those nice people at timeanddate.com provide us with, but I'm not sure their information is as accurate as they'd have us believe. So let's look a bit closer. So that we can all get our bearings, most people are familiar with lines of longitude. On a globe, they run from the North Pole, traditionally at the top, to the South Pole at the bottom. And on a flat disk, they run from the North Pole at the middle to the south around the edge. The traditional globe has a line called the equator that runs east and west around the centre of the globe. On a circular map, it follows a midline between the North Pole and the edge. There are more latitude lines that run parallel to the equator, but for the sake of simplicity, let's stick with the lines that are 30 degrees and 60 degrees on each side of the equator. On the disk map, the same lines form concentric circles around the North Pole. There are two more lines, about 23 and a half degrees on each side of the equator. They are colloquially called the Tropic of Cancer to the north and the Tropic of Capricorn to the south. On the circular map, they are just inside the 30 degree line and will provide us with a useful reference later. Latitude lines provide us with an indicator to show us how far we are from the North Pole. And by a couple of clicks with your mouse, you can find your own latitude anywhere on the surface of the Earth. Yes, even for those of you who still think we live on a little ball. For our purposes here, we can dispense with the lines of longitude. The lines of latitude provide us with all the information that we need for the moment. Back in episode 12, I explained that a planisphere is a flat map of a spherical surface. The flat, circular map of the world has been wrapped around a ball to provide a model for the globe. A planisphere and a globe both share the same information, except that one of them is flat and the other is spherical. In the same way that the surface of the Earth can be modelled as a globe, so too can the skies. Some of you may be familiar with this model. It shows the sky surrounding the globe. And in the same way that the Earth can be shown as a disc or a ball, so too can the skies. This is an astronomical planisphere. It's a flat map of the sky above the Earth. I don't want to get too waylaid here with the question of whether the sky above our heads is a dome or some other shape except to say that there appears to be a structure of some description above our heads, and that will be sufficient for our purposes here. An astronomical planisphere is an observation tool. It shows what the sky looks like from the ground. It comprises two disks that are riveted together so that one rotates over the other. Any half-decent astronomical planisphere will have the same essential elements. The top disc is transparent and has a window called a ground mask to show the limits of your horizon and through which you can see part of the sky above. Although you can't really see it here, there's a faint blue cross at the centre of the window to show you, the observer, in the middle. I'll mark it here with a red dot to make it a bit clearer. I mentioned back in episode 12 that while this model glows in the dark, it's not as practical as one might think, but it does have one advantage, that I can pull a whole ground mask off and see what's underneath. The bottom layer is generally called a star map or sky map. Around the edge, you can see the 12 months of the solar year, and inside of that, you can see the days of each month. Depending on the manufacturer, some show each day of the month, and some show them in two or three day intervals. The difference matters little. I'm going to stick with using this particular model as it lets me see most of the sky in one go. 
the center section is a map of the lights in the sky, but it looks rather busy, lots of dots. So let's see if we can simplify things. The stars you can see here are called background stars, with Polaris at the center. Looking upwards, the whole sky rotates anti-clockwise, east to west around Polaris. Yes, even south of the equator. And in the same way that the surface of the Earth can be divided up with latitude and longitude lines, so too can the skies. The sky has an equator called the celestial equator, but a closer look will show that the celestial equator is about the same size and perfectly aligned with the equator below. You can see which stars pass above which points on the Earth. This particular sky map is big enough to show the sky from Polaris, which is above the North Pole, all the way out to the 60 degree line just inside the Antarctic Circle. Like the surface of the Earth, the sky is also divided up with longitude lines, but given that the sky is constantly rotating, those lines have little to do with those on the surface of the Earth. But we'll take a closer look at them in a moment. Around the edge of the ground mask, it shows the 24 hours of the solar day and can be rotated to show which stars are above the observer at any time of day or night. Remember that you can't see the stars while the sun is above your horizon, but they are still there. The ground mask also shows the cardinal directions, north, east, south and west, but a closer look will show that they run counter to those on a standard compass rose. That's because they're showing what the sky looks like above your head. You'll also see that the observation point is at the 51 degree latitude line, but for our purposes here, it's good enough to show us how the sky passes over the Earth for a good 80 degree radius around that point. The only reason different ground masks are provided for different locations around the world is to accurately show astronomers which part of the sky is immediately above them. If I rotate the ground mask so that the time of day matches the date, it will show what the sky looks like above my head. And as the day moves along by the hour, it shows the sky rotating above me. The sky makes one full rotation in 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds. It's called a sidereal day. But since man has decided to use a 24 hour day, based on the movement of the sun, the sky makes a little over one full rotation each day. In fact, each point in the sky travels about 361 degrees in 24 hours. It's worth mentioning here that some flat earthers appear to have concluded that the sidereal day was invented to hide the fact that 24 hour days don't work for a spinning ball. Let me counter only with the suggestion that people go out and take a closer look at the sky for themselves. It's not just the sun that travels around each sidereal day, the moon and the stars do too. By way of an example, let's suppose we pick one star for a moment. I'll use Betelgeuse and watch it for a whole day. You'll see that it approaches from the east, it crosses the sky and it sets in the west. In fact, it continues beyond your western horizon and continues all the way around until it arrives back on your eastern horizon the next day. If we let the whole process repeat again, you'll see that if we look at the stars at exactly the same time each night, they gradually drift west as the year moves along, and eventually, one year later, the star that you're looking at will pass the eastern horizon at exactly the same time of day and the whole process is repeated again. So let's look closer. If I remove the ground mask again, we can take a closer look at the sky. I mentioned a moment ago that the sky is divided up and can help us to find our way around. The celestial equator is immediately above the equator below and divides the sky into two areas that are north and south of the equator. The sky also has meridian lines, running from Polaris at the middle to the south around the edge. There are 12 prominent meridian lines, 
and given that all circles can be divided into 360 degrees, these meridian lines are spaced 30 degrees apart. The latitude lines in the sky form concentric circles around Polaris, and like the surface of the Earth below, they are referenced using degrees that work from zero points at the celestial equator. There is another reference in the sky called the ecliptic that's about the same size as the celestial equator, about 25,000 miles. It's easy to identify as it's been populated by the signs of the zodiac. They are nothing more than dot to dot pictures that are part of the entire background. Beginning with Aries, they run to Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces. If I bring up the meridian lines, you can see that the sky is divided into 12 sections and there is one zodiac sign for each section. It's useful as it gives us a better idea of where to find things. The astrologers of this world might be able to help us here as they look at the sky as a self-contained system. Each of the 12 sections are called houses and each one is named for its dominant zodiac sign. One of the things that many flat earthers struggle with is the sun. So let's take a closer look. We tend to track the sun based on our position on the ground, but let's suppose we look at it in another way. If we look at it against the background stars, our position below needs nothing more than for us to know how far we are from the center. We can then look up and know what we expect to see. Looking upwards, the sun travels clockwise along the ecliptic. In fact, it takes a year to travel around the ecliptic. So if all circles can be divided into 360 degrees, it means that the sun travels about one degree per day along the ecliptic. The position of the sun on the ecliptic can be found for any day of the year by laying a straight edge from the center of the sky to the date that we're looking at it. So let's suppose we start with December 22nd. You'll see why in a moment. You'll see the sun is just entering into the house of Sagittarius, but you'll also recall that the whole sky makes one full rotation that day too. The net effect is on December 22nd, the sun describes this path over the face of the earth. I'm not going to repeat this for every day of the year, but we can keep track of things if we watch it month by month. If the sun travels 360 degrees around the ecliptic in one year, then it must travel an average of about 30 degrees in each of the 12 months. So if I let the meridian lines divide the ecliptic into 12 sections, we can see where the sun is on the ecliptic month by month. We started on December 22nd, so one month later, I can lay a straight edge to January 22nd, and you'll see that the sun is just entering into the house of Capricorn. The sky makes more full rotation that day, so the sun describes this path over the earth. By February 22nd, it's heading into Aquarius, and it describes this path over the earth. By March 22nd, it's heading into Pisces, and you'll see that as the sky rotates that day, the path of the sun is above the equator, the spring equinox. It continues along the ecliptic, so that by the middle of April, it's entering into Aries, and describes this path above the earth. By the middle of May, it's in Taurus and describes this path. And by the middle of June, it's heading into Gemini. And you see that the Sun's path above the Earth is much closer to Polaris than when we started. In fact, if you think back to the surface for a moment, you'll see that as the sky rotates that day, the Sun passes over the Tropic of Cancer, the northern Sun Solstice. By the middle of July, the Sun is heading into Cancer, and its path that day is slowly heading away from Polaris again. By the middle of August, it's heading into Leo, and by mid-September, 
it's heading into Virgo, and its path that day has returned to passing over the equator again, the autumn equinox. By the middle of October, the Sun is heading into Libra, and its path over the Earth has now moved south of the equator. By the middle of November, it's heading into Scorpio, and by the middle of December, it's heading back into Sagittarius, and its path that day is travelling over the Tropic of Capricorn, one year from where we began. In a nutshell, that's the journey that the Sun makes over the Earth by the space of one year. If I retrace the 12 daily paths that we just saw, starting in mid-December, you'll see that the path of the Sun moves progressively from the Tropic of Capricorn to the Tropic of Cancer in June, and then returns in the opposite direction until it reaches the Tropic of Capricorn again one year later. If you watch the path of the Sun around the ecliptic, you can see how it travels between the tropics over the space of the year. The daily movement along the ecliptic is too slow for us to notice, but the daily rotation of the sky around Polaris is sufficient for us to observe if we take a little time and have the patience to watch. We've only looked at this by 30 day intervals, but it's been sufficient for us to see how the sky is moving day by day. We used the 12 houses of the zodiac. Each one spans 30 degrees in the sky to cover a total of 360 degrees over the year. But man, in his wisdom, has created a year using 365 days. Don't ask me why. And that's ignoring the leap years that are needed to adjust the clock every four years. If you look closely, you'll see that as the year progresses, the sun ends up slightly out of step with the signs of the zodiac. And certainly begs the question that if the sun is the centre of everything, why is the solar calendar so woefully wide of the mark? But that's a question for another day. If I put all 12 paths on together and replace the ground mask, you can see how the sun sweeps from your eastern horizon to your western horizon each month. While the sun is within your horizon, the sky turns blue and it bleaches out the light from the stars. But as the sun passes beyond your horizon, the stars become visible again. Simple really. So you've now seen how the sun travels along the ecliptic. Well guess what? So does the moon. The planisphere works well to keep track of the sun and it's accurate enough to be used for the whole year. The dates around the edge are provided for a 366 day leap year, but that one extra day is negligible for the purposes of following the sun and the stars. But one can't help wondering why they don't make one of these things to track the moon too. The moon travels around the ecliptic in the same way as the sun, but with a difference. The moon takes one month to travel around the ecliptic and the process each month doesn't repeat itself nearly as regularly as the sun does. You'd need separate planispheres for every month of the year, but before we move on, I invite you to think back to episode 11. The lights in the sky all follow very precise patterns, and anyone who knows where they are can use them to find their location anywhere on the surface of the Earth. They provide us with a very accurate reference system. Did you ever wonder why the alleged GPS satellites are called constellations? The lights in the sky have been used for many centuries by navigators to plot their positions, especially on the open oceans where there are very few points of reference. The naval institutions and the astrological priests of the world have long kept track of the lights in the sky. And if you cross their palm with silver, they'll even tell you where they are. To find the location of the lights in the sky for any time and date, we use a book called an ephemeris. I mentioned a moment ago that the sky is divided into 12 equal sections, 30 degrees wide, and that each one is named for its zodiac sign. You'll also recall that the sky makes one full rotation in 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4 seconds. This is the ephemeris for March 2015. 
it looks rather complicated, so let's see if we can simplify things. Down the left hand side, you can see the days of the month using the solar calendar. And the next column shows the corresponding days of the week. The position of the lights in the sky each day are given for midday at Greenwich in London. The next column shows the corresponding sidereal time compared to Greenwich, but it doesn't really concern us here for the moment. The next two columns have a little symbol at the top, a circle with a dot in the middle. It's the standard astronomical symbol for the Sun, but we've already seen the Sun using the planisphere so we can skip it for the moment. Like the Sun, the Moon also travels around the ecliptic, but it does so in one month. The Moon travels much faster around the ecliptic than the Sun does. In fact, it travels about 13 degrees along the ecliptic each day. You'll recall me saying earlier that each house of the zodiac covers a 30 degree span of the sky, so the next column shows how far the Moon has travelled through each house for each day of the month. I've plotted the moon positions here for every day of the month, but for our purposes here, we really only need to watch a few key points. If we start with March 1st, you'll see that the moon is in Cancer. And as the sky rotates that day, the moon describes this path over the surface of the Earth. Somewhat conveniently, it's near the Tropic of Cancer. By March 7th, it's reached as far as Libra. It describes this path over the face of the Earth, and you'll see that it's just past the equator. By March 14th, it's reached Capricorn. It describes this path over the Earth, and you'll see that it's approaching the Tropic of Capricorn. By March 19th, it's reached Pisces, and describes this path back above the equator again, and it finally returns to Cancer on March 27th, and we're back where we started. You'll see that by the space of one month, the Moon travels from the Tropic of Cancer to the Tropic of Capricorn and back again. In the same way that the Earth uses latitude lines to show positions relative to the equator, so too does the sky. But in the sky, the word declination is used instead to describe how far a particular point is from the equator. I don't want to complicate matters any further for the moment, but for those of you who want to take a closer look, the positions on each of the dates that we've just used can be confirmed in the declination column to show how the moon travels between the tropics each month. If I trace the moon's path, you can compare it to the sun's ecliptic path, shown here in yellow. You'll notice that they are slightly different from each other. The Sun's ecliptic path above the surface of the Earth seems to be parallel with the surface below. The ecliptic path of the Moon is not parallel to the surface of the Earth, it's at an angle of about 5 degrees to that of the Sun. As the Moon circles above the Earth, sometimes it's higher than the Sun and sometimes it's lower. The Moon's position above or below the Sun's path is shown in the Moon's latitude column, and the column marked as Node is simply the point where the two paths cross. So let's wrap this one up for now. Most of us have lived our lives believing that we live on a little ball flying through space. Everything we know has been based on that assumption. So once we realised that the Earth is flat, we all have to start again with a blank sheet of paper. The Sun, the Moon and the stars all seem to provide a remarkable clock in the sky, and each of them can provide us with different pieces of information about the world in which we live. And finally, one issue that's frequently thrown at flat earthers is that we can't explain the cause of lunar eclipses. You've all heard the old mythology about invisible monsters gobbling up the sun and the moon and used to provide much material with which to ridicule the flat earth. So try this one for size. <laughs>